Father, we thank you so much for the day. We thank you so much for the opportunity that we have together. We thank you for the reason. Thank you that your son was willing to come here to Father, be born the way he was, to live the life he did, and, and to go to the cross for us. Father, tonight we celebrate that birth. We celebrate uh, his life. We just pray that you'll be with us and guide us through this time. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.
The owner of the inn had awakened earlier than most in his town. After all, the inn was full, all the beds taken. Every available mat or blanket was used. Soon all the customers would be stirring and there would be people to feed, work to be done. One's imagination was kindled thinking about the conversation of the innkeeper and the family at the breakfast table. Did anyone mention the arrival of the young couple that night before? Did anyone comment on the pregnancy of the girl or think that perhaps maybe they should have done something different? But at best, it was raised, not discussed. There was nothing that novel about them. They were just a young man and a young girl. Besides, who had time to talk about that when there was so much excitement going on in the air? Augustus did the economy of Bethlehem a huge favor when he decreed that the census should take place and each in their hometown. Who could remember when such commerce had happened in this small village? No, it is doubtful for anyone mentioned the couple or the animal that she rode or wondered about the condition of the girl this morning. They were too busy. The day was upon them. The day's bread had been made. The morning's chores had been done. There was too much to do. Imagine that the impossible had just occurred. They did not imagine. God had entered the world as a baby. Yet were someone to chance upon the sheep stable and to find them there at the outskirts of the town of Bethlehem that morning? What a peculiar scene that would have been. The stable stinks like all stables do. The stench of urine, dung, and sheep reeks pungently in the air. The ground was hard, the hay was scarce. Cobwebs clung to the ceiling and a mouse scurried across the floor. A more lowly place for birth could not have been found.
<laughs> Off to one side sits a small group of shepherds. They sit silently on the floor, perhaps perplexed, perhaps in awe, no doubt in amazement. Their night watch had been interrupted by an explosion of light from heaven and a symphony of angels. God goes to those who have time to hear him. So on this cloudless night, he went to simple shepherds. Near the young mother sits the weary father. If anyone is dozing, he is. He can't remember the last time he sat down. And now that the excitement had subsided a bit, now that Mary and the baby were comfortable, he leans against the wall of the stable and feels his eyes grow heavy. He still hasn't figured it all out. The mystery of the event still puzzles him. But he hasn't, he hasn't the energy to wrestle with the question yet. What's important is that the baby is fine, that Mary is safe. As sleep comes, he remembers the name that the angels told him to use, Jesus. He will call his name Jesus. Wide awake is Mary. My, how young she looks. Her head rests on the soft leather of Joseph's saddle. The pain had been eclipsed by wonder. She looks into the face of the baby, her son, her Lord, his majesty. At this point in history, the human being who best understands what God is, who God is, and what he is going to do is a teenager girl in a smelly stable. She can't take her eyes off him. Somehow Mary knows she is holding God. So this is he. She remembers the word of the angel. The kingdom will never, his kingdom will never end. He looks anything but a king. His face is prunish and red. His cry, though strong and healthy, is still the helpless and piercing cry of a baby. And he is absolutely dependent upon Mary for his well-being. Majesty in the midst of the mundane. Holiness in the filth of sheep manure and sweat. Divinity entering the world on the floor of a stable, through the womb of a teenager, and in the presence of a carpenter. She touches the face of the infant God. How long was your journey? The baby had overlooked the universe. These rags keeping him warm were the robes of eternity. His golden throne had been abandoned in a favor of a dirty sheep pen. And worshiping angels had been replaced with a kind of bewildered shepherd. Meanwhile, the city, the city hums. The merchants are unaware that God has visited their planet. The innkeeper would never believe that he had just sent God into the cold. And the people would scoff at anyone who told them the Messiah lay in the arms of a teenager in the outskirts of the village. They were all too busy to consider the possibility. Those who missed his majesty, who missed his arrival, who missed that night, missed it. Not because of evil acts of malice. No, they missed it because, simply, they weren't looking. They were too busy. Little has changed in the last 2,000 years, has it? It happened in a moment, and the moment was remarkable.
was spoken by the man whose neighbors tried to kill him. The challenge to leave family for the gospel was issued by one who kissed his mother goodbye in the doorway. Pray for those who persecute you, came off the lips of the one who soon would be begging God for, to forgive his murderers. I am with you always on the words, God, who in one instant did it, the impossible to make it possible for you and me. It all happened in a moment. In a moment, a most remarkable moment, the Word became flesh. There will be another. The world will see another instantaneous transformation. You see, in becoming man, God made it possible for man to see God. When Jesus went home, he left the back door open. As a result, we all will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. The first moment of transformation went unnoticed in the world, but you can bet your sweet September that the second one will not. The next time you use the phrase, just a moment, remember that all it took was a moment to change the world. For though you belong to a king, 
you will touch no satin, own no gold, you will grasp no pen, guide no brush. Know your tiny hands are reserved for works more precious, to touch a leper's open wounds, to wipe a widow's weary tears, to claw the ground of Gethsemane. Your hands so tiny, so white, clutch tonight in an infant's fist, they aren't destined to hold a scepter, nor wave from a palace balcony. They're reserved instead for Roman spikes that will staple them to a Roman cross. Sleep deeply, tiny eyes. Sleep while you can, for soon the blurriness will clear and you will see the mess we have made of this world. You will see our nakedness, for we cannot hide. You will see our selfishness, for we cannot give. You will see our pain, for we cannot heal. O oh, eyes that will see hell's darkest pit and witness her ugly prince, sleep, please sleep, sleep while you can. Lie still, tiny mouth, lie still, mouth from which eternity will speak. Tiny tongue that will soon summon the dead, that will define grace, that will silence our foolishness. Rosebud lips upon which ride a starborn kiss of forgiveness to those who believe you and death to those who deny you. Lie still, little child. And tiny feet, cupped in the palm of my hand, rest. For many difficult steps lie ahead of you. Do you taste the dust of the trails you will travel? Do you feel the cold seawater upon which you will walk? Do you wrench at the envision of the nail that you will keep there? Do you fear the steep descent down the spiral staircase into Satan's domain. Rest, tiny feet. Rest today so that tomorrow you might walk with power. Rest for millions will follow in your steps. And little heart, holy heart, pumping the blood of life through this universe, how many times will we, will we break you? You'll be torn by the thorns of accusation. You'll be ravaged by the cancer of sin. You'll be crushed under the weight of our own sorrow and you'll be pierced by a spear of our rejection. Yet in that piercing, in that ultimate ripping of muscles and membrane, in that final rush of blood and water, you will find rest. Your hands will be free, your eyes will see justice, your lips will smile, and your feet will carry you home. And there you'll rest again, to this time in the embrace of your Father.
The baby, chose, uh, baby does change everything. And Mary began to ponder these things. She might have thought, what was it like to watch him pray? How did he respond when he saw other kids giggling during the service at the synagogue? When he saw a rainbow, did he ever mention a flood? Did you ever feel awkward teaching him how to create the world? When he saw the lamb being led to slaughter, did he act differently? Did you ever see him with distant look in his face as he were listening to someone who you couldn't hear? How did he act at funerals? Did the thought ever occur to you that God to whom you were praying was asleep under your own roof? Did you ever try to count the stars with him and succeed? Did he ever come home with a black eye? How did he act when he got his first haircut? Did he have any, any friends by the name of Judas? Did he do well in school? Did you ever have to scold him? Did he ever have to ask a question about scriptures? What do you think he thought when he saw a prostitute offering the highest bidder to the, bo to the body that he made? Did he ever get angry with someone who was dishonest with him? Did you ever catch him pensively looking at the flesh of his own arm while holding a clot of dirt? Did he ever wake afraid? Who was his best friend? When someone referred to Satan, how did he act? Did you ever accidentally call him father? What did he and his cousin John talk about as kids? Did his other brothers and sisters understand what was happening? Did you ever think that God's eating my soup? Questions that parents, we think. We think about it. I was sitting here just a couple minutes ago wondering if the child would ever be quiet. <laughs> we wonder things, don't we? And yet, there's questions. Gabriel, he must have scratched his head at this one. He wasn't one, one to question his God-given mission. Sending fire, dividing seas were all in eternity's work for his, this angel. When God sent Gabriel, Gabriel went. And when God, when the word got out that God was to become man, Gabriel was enthused. He could envision the moment, the Messiah in a blazing chariot, the king descending on a fiery cloud, the an explosion of light from which the Messiah would emerge. That's what he expected. What he, what he never expected, however, was what he got. A slip of paper with a Nazarene address. God will become a baby, Fred. Tell the mother to name the child Jesus. Tell her to not be afraid. Gabriel was never one to question, but this time he had to wonder. God will become a baby? Gabriel had seen babies before. He had seen a platoon leader on the bulrush operation. He remembered what little Moses looked like. That's okay for humans, he thought to himself. But God? The heavens can't contain him. How could a body? Besides, have you seen what comes out of those babies? Hardly befitting the creator of the universe. Babies must be carried and fed and bounced and bathed. To imagine some mother burping God on her shoulder, that was beyond what Gabriel could stand. He couldn't even imagine it. And what of his name? What was it? Jesus. Such a common name. There's a Jesus in every cul-de-sac. Come on. Even Gabriel has more punch than that. Than Jesus. Call the baby eminence, your majesty, or heaven sent. Anything but Jesus. So great Gabriel scratched his head. What happened to the good old days? The Sodom and Gomorrah stuff, the flooding of the globe, the flaming swords. That's the action that he liked. But Gabriel had his orders. Take this message down to a girl named Mary. Must be a special girl, he assumed as he traveled. But Gabriel was in for another shock. One peak told him Mary was no queen. The mother to be of God was not regal. She was a Jewish peasant, 
who had barely outgrown acne and had crushed on a guy named Joe. And speaking of Joe, what does this fellow know? Might as well be a weaver in Spain or cobbler in Greece. He's a carpenter. How much more plain can you get? Look at him over there, sawdust in his beard, nail apron around his waist. You're telling me God is going to have dinner every night with him? You're telling me the source of wisdom is going to be this guy? He's going to call him dad? You're telling me a common laborer is going to be charged with giving food to the creator? What if he gets laid off? What if he gets cranky? What if he decides to run off with a pretty young girl from down the street? Then where will we be? It was all Gabriel could do to keep from turning back. This is a peculiar idea you have, God. He must have muttered that to himself several times. Are God's guardians given to such musings? Are we? Are we still stunning? Are we still stunned by God's coming? Still staggered by the events of that night? Does Christmas still spawn the same speechless wonder it did 2,000 years ago? I've been asking that question lately. As I write, Christmas is only days away. Something just happened that has me concerned that the pace of the holiday may be overshadowing the purpose of the holiday. I saw a manger in a mall. Correct that. I barely saw a manger in a mall. I almost didn't see it. I was in a hurry. Guests coming, guests going, Santa dropping in, sermons to be prepared, services to be planned, presents to be purchased, gifts to be wrapped. The crush of things was so great that the crutch of Christ was almost ignored. I nearly missed it myself. And it is not for me, it is, and it has not been for the child of this father, I would have. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw them. The little boy, three, maybe four, in jeans, high tops, staring at the manger's infant. The father in a baseball hat, work clothes, looking over the son's shoulder, gesturing first at Joseph, and then Mary, and then the baby. He was telling the story, the story we all know. And oh, the twinkle in the little boy's eyes, the wonder on his little face. He didn't speak. He just listened to his dad. And I didn't move either. I just watched. What questions were filling the little boy's head? Could they have been the same as Gabriel's? What sparked the amazement on his face? Was it the magic? The magic of Jesus? And why is it that out of a hundred or so of God's children, only two paused to consider his son? What is December? What is the December demon that steals our eyes and steals our tongues? Isn't this the season to pause and pose Gabriel's questions? The tragedy is not that we cannot answer them, but that we are too busy to even ask them. Only heaven knows how long Gabriel fluttered unseen above Mary before he took breath and broke the news. But he did it. He was sent to do it, so he had to do it. He told her the name. He told her the plan. He told her not to be afraid. And when he announced, with God, nothing is impossible, he said it as much for himself as he did for her. For even though he couldn't answer the questions, he knew, he, he knew who could. And that was enough. And even though he can't answer them all, taking the time to ask a few questions this year, this time, this week, this day, will be a good start. We're going to uh, be singing the next song. And uh, at the end of that song, we'll have prayer and we're going to be able to come and partake of uh, communion with us tonight if we remember Jesus Christ. Tonight is birth, but also, as we've seen throughout the night, is death. It gives us hope and the ability to be here tonight. So we're going to sing the song and then more. Our people will be.
you so much for your son. We thank you so much for this season that we can celebrate his birth. But Father, we all too well know that his birth just led to the cross. We know why he came. We know why he had to come. Father, to save sinners like us. Father, we thank you for the memorial he left us, the communion. That we can remember the life he lived, remember the death that he suffered, but remember that he rose from the dead. That he defeated death to give us hope of eternity with him. Father, he's there now, preparing a place for us. Help us to think on those things. From the cradle to the cross, help us to remember his life. We pray this in your son's name. Christmas night. The house was quiet. Even the crackle was gone from the fireplace. Warm coals issued a light, lighthouse glow to the darkness of the room. Stockings hang empty on the mantel. The tree stands naked in the corner. Christmas cards, tinsel, and memories remind Christmas night of Christmas, remind us of Christmas night of Christmas Day. It's Christmas night. What a day it has been. Spiced tea, Santa Claus, cranberry sauce. Thank you so much. You shouldn't have grandma's on the phone, knee-deep wrapping paper. It all just fits. Flashing cameras, memories. It's Christmas night. The girls are in bed. Dreams are dreams of her taking Big Bird and clutches in her new purse. Andrea sleeps in her new Santa pajamas. It's Christmas night. The tree only yesterday grew from soil made of gifts, again grows from Christmas <coughs> tree stand. Presents are now possessions, wrapping paper is bagged, and in the dump site. The dishes are washed, the leftover turkey awaits next week's sandwiches. It's Christmas night. Last of the carolers appeared on, at 10 o'clock on the news. 
Last of the apple pie was eaten by my brother-in-law. Last of the Christmas albums had been stored away, having beautifully performed their annual rendition of Chestnuts, White Christmas, and Red Nose, and Rudolph Red Nose Reindeer. It's Christmas night. The midnight hour has chimed and I should be asleep, but I'm awake. I'm kept awake by one stunning thought. The world was different this week. It was temporarily transformed. The magical dust of Christmas glittered on the cheeks of humanity ever so briefly, reminding us of what it's worth having and what it's worth and what it's intended for. We forget our compulsion of winning, wooing, and warring. We put away our ladders and ledgers. We hung up our stopwatches and weapons. We stepped off the racetracks and roller coasters and looked outward towards the star of Bethlehem. It's the season to be jolly because more than at any other time, we think about it. More than any other season, we think about it. More than any other time, his name is on our lips. And as a result, for a few precious hours, our heavenly yearnings intermesh with what we've become. A ragtag chorus of longshoremen, Boston lawyers, illegal immigrants, housewives, and thousands of other peculiar persons who are banking that Bethlehem's mystery is in reality a reality. <clears throat> Come and behold him, we sing, stirring even the steepest and the sleepiest <coughs> shepherds, pointing to them that point us towards the Christ child. For a few precious hours, he is beheld. Christ is once again Lord. <coughs> Wait, he's always been Lord. Those who pass the year without seeing him suddenly see him. People who have been accustomed to using his name in vain pause to use it in a phrase. <coughs> they even use it as a phrase. Eyes, now free of blinders of self, marvel at his majesty. All of a sudden, he's everywhere. In the grin of the policeman as he drives his paddy wagon, full of presents to the orphanage. In the twinkle of the eyes of the Taiwanese waiter who tells of his upcoming Christmas trip to see his children. In the emotion of the father who is too thankful to finish the dinner table prayer. He is in tears of the mother as he welcomes home her son from overseas. He's in the heart of the man who spent Christmas morning on Skid Row giving away cold bologna sandwiches and warm wishes. He's in the solemn silence of the crowd shopping, crowd shopping in the mall, shoppers as the elementary school chorus sings away in the manger. Emmanuel, he is with us. God came near. This year has been a tough year. Tough year to people in their jobs, tough year to people in their homes, <coughs> tough year when it comes to sickness, tough year when it comes to loss. It's been a tough year. It's been a tough year to be a minister, but it's been a great year to be a minister. It's been a great year to be his. It's been a great year to point towards him. I found it only fitting that this week we should have the alignment of planets or the Bethlehem star or the Christmas star, whatever they want to call it. It's only fitting that after a year like this, all people were talking about him. For one moment, we turned to him. We looked at a star in the sky, and we thought about him. We shut down just for a few minutes. The star only lasted in our vision two hours. And as it went around the world, everybody saw it. Everybody wondered. Everybody talked. My Facebook blew up with pictures. Some of the best pictures came from the other side of the world where the star looked like it had a long tail, wide, it, it looked like a cross. But everybody stopped and wondered. Did you ever wonder if this year was to bring us back to God? 
to make us look towards him. To look at a virus and say, you know, I've, I've got to have something. I have trust. I have faith. I have Jesus. Do you truly believe whatever may come? Come Jesus quickly? Do we believe that? Do we share that with our friends? And it's Christmas. It's the time of year that everybody tries to do better. It's the time of year that we as Christians should be our best. See, I talked to some of my friends online about the star, about the things. I, I wrote a couple things to tell them, you know, it, it's, it's neat. Don't get me wrong, it is neat. But I think what we're doing here is talking about a baby and a manger that a star, unlike any other star man has ever seen, was shining. I think it was brighter than the star we saw the other night. I know it was more important than the star we saw the other night. I know it showed both day and night so that the men from afar could get there. Tonight we're looking at Jesus, the reason for the light, the reason that we sit here tonight, the reason that we celebrate Christmas. I know this. Christmas is going to be different this year in our house. We didn't go out and buy frivolous gifts just so they had things to open. We did that in the past. We're not going and throwing some huge thing. I mean, we're going to have a meal and we're going to enjoy ourselves as family, but it's going to be different. This year has been different. We can look back and look at respect on it and just admire how God has seen us through. And no matter what happens in 2021, God's going to see us through. God has always been good. Always. I trust Him. I gave my life to Him. I serve Him. I try my best to tell others about Him. Christmas is a great season because everybody gets on board. But our Christmas should be all year long. Every Sunday we celebrate that birth and that death. Every time we come to the communion table, we celebrate that. Celebrate it this Christmas. Give God, give the Creator, give Jesus to those around you. A gift that will never fail, never break, and never run out. We're going to close this service with a song, Hallelujah. We just want you to listen to it. Listen to the words real close. Listen to it as it's sung. When it's done, we'll have a closing prayer, and we'll be done. We thank you for being here with us. We thank you for the reason we're here, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the ability that we have to worship and honor Him. Not just this Christmas season, but all year long. We hope that you'll come back and join us in that worship of Him Sunday and throughout the rest of the year.
shepherd's love His heart's bright light To see this baby be wrapped in light A host of angels led them all to you It was just as the angels said You'll find a man Star so bright up in the east to Bethlehem the wise men free came many miles and journeyed long for you and to the place at which you were the frankincense. My sins would drive the nails in you. The rugged cross was my cross too. Till every breath you drew was hallelujah. 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 Father, go with us tonight. Keep us safe. Guide us and bless us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.